Hi, angels. So your classmates spent the last period starting our new unit, the medieval period. We took notes, we played a couple of like reviewing games as we went along and filled up that whole two hours. I made an abbreviated version for you for this hour-ish class period online. So all you need to do is watch this video that gives you the lecture and the background notes. And then I already gave you a physical copy of the notes outline that I made for you, the medieval background notes. So as you watch this and you look at the PowerPoint, you can be filling in that notes as you go. And then you have two options. You can either take a picture of it, upload it to your Google Drive, and then you'll turn it in on the classroom that way. Or if you want, you could type the notes as you go and turn that into the Google Classroom as a Google Doc. But the only thing I'm gonna say is you'll either have to print it out or rewrite it anyway, because just like your last test, I'll let you use the notes on your test. So you're not going to want to have an electronic version of these in the end, because you'll wanna use them on your next um, exam for the medieval period when we get to that point. So those are your two options. You can handwrite it and take a picture and submit it on the Google Classroom that way, or you can type it, but you'll just have to either print it out or handwrite it again anyway. So I'll leave that up to you. So starting on the very first bullet point for the medieval background notes, um, it's gonna ask you when this period begins. It's on the next slide anyway. And I will put it up here. So the medieval period starts in 1066. If anybody remembers from the last unit, the Anglo-Saxon period, we said it went from 449 to 1066. So that makes sense that this is right when this period starts. They all just begin and end at the same place. So in 1066, that's the year that scholars pick is the beginning of the medieval period because that's when something major happened, a major change that marked the transition from the Anglo-Saxons to this period. And in 1066, the Duke of Normandy invaded what is now England. So all the way back in the Anglo-Saxon period, they weren't even a country. They were still the British provinces. Um, but through the last 600 years or so, they became a country, England. Um, and in 1066, the Duke of Normandy, his name is William, he was the Duke of Normandy, a place in France. He takes his guys and they attack England. Um, the Anglo-Saxons had been attacked many times before in the last 600 years, but usually this was an attack and then they raided them, they took their money or their resources, and then they got out of there. But this attack from the Duke of Normandy was a full-on invasion and occupation. So he came in and attacked them and then he stuck around and declared himself the King of England. And he ruled on the throne for 21 years until his death. So this was not, like I said, just another kind of hit and run and get out of there. He stayed, he declared himself the king. And then when he died, he avoided the mistake that many other English kings do by having an heir to the throne. He had a son. And so even after his death, his son took over and his line of secession continued from that point on. So again, if you're following along with that sheet at home, you can already have answered those first couple of bullet points down for through ruled England for 21 years and assured succession at his death. Who are the Normans? We said that William is the Duke of Normandy. Who are these guys? They had descended from Vikings who had previously lived in northwestern France. So when they come to England, they bring with them some French customs and some variations of their French language. And so a lot of the words that we actually speak today, even though they descended from the Anglo-Saxons Old English, were also merged together with the French that the Normans brought with them. So I'm gonna show you a couple of words on the next slide that we speak today that actually came from the French language. It was believed at the time and through most of history that the Normans civilized the Anglo-Saxons, that the Anglo-Saxons were just these uncivilized tribes that needed to be you know, cleaned up by the Normans. But that actually wasn't true. The Anglo-Saxons were more civilized in a lot of aspects. And so eventually 
they just blended together a mixture of both of their cultures. So it wasn't like the Normans came in and took over and the Anglo-Saxon culture and way of life totally disappeared. Um, they sort of merged together and developed a, a blend of their cultures that was part Norman and part Anglo-Saxon. And so I usually ask someone in class to take a guess as what their relationship name would be. You know, when a couple starts dating, um, you mix their name, Brad and Angelina, Brangelina. So what would the Anglo-Saxons and the Normans be? Well, they called them the Anglo-Normans. And so that's a um, bullet point for you on your notes. They called them the Anglo-Normans. That was the blend of both of their cultures kind of coming together, the Anglo-Saxons and the Normans. So you don't need to write anything on this slide down. This is just some examples of the French language that the Normans brought that kind of integrated itself into our English. So the Normans brought their French language that blended with Old English. Can you guess what these words became? So the French word, is for rock. I don't even know how to pronounce the, I'm not good on the French. Um, the Norman word became forch in the modern English word, if you could guess. I'll put them all up here. It's fork. Maybe you, you kind of heard that in my pronunciation, but the word fork comes from the Normans. So it was adapted from their version of French, kind of blended with the Anglo-Saxon English, and it became fork. That second one, also, I think you can kind of maybe guess of what it, it could be. Chandelle, Kanda is a candle. That's another example of a word that derived from the Anglo-Normans French in the um, Anglo-Saxons Old English. I feel like I'm going to pronounce that third one. I already know what the answer is. Um, but the way you're saying it in your head, maybe it already sounds like what it's going to be. Cabbage. The word is cabbage, caboche. I guess is how I would pronounce the French one. And then that last one is a tricky one. It's probably not what you would guess, but there we have the French word, the Norman version. And then what do you think the modern English version is? Pocket. I think the Norman one kind of gives it away, but the, the French version, I would have never thought that it was pocket. But just an example of little things that have um, adapted in our language over time. So from the Anglo-Saxons who spoke Old English, they kind of blended together with some of these French words from the Normans. The word people, for example, is very French uh, in origin, in addition to all of these. All right, back to the notes. So when the Duke of Normandy, his name is William, like I said before, when he took over, he, as the king, decided, I'm going to give a bunch of land to me and my guys to my faithful followers. And so he divvied up the land, okay, this very big estate, this big farm, I'm gonna give it to this guy and this one to this guy, his friends and his followers. And so the year 1066, when he took over, saw the biggest change in land ownership in all of England's history. Since then, there has never been another event or incident like this where the land that people had lived on for a long time, the Anglo-Saxons had been there for 600 years, and now all of a sudden this guy's coming in and said, hey, yeah, I know your family has lived on this land for a long time, but I'm going to give it to my friend instead. And so he totally divvied up the land in England and changed the land ownership and kind of gave it to his guys as the king. He had the power to do that. Not necessarily the nicest thing to do, but that's what he did. So he gave a lot of the land to him and his faithful followers in the year 1066, saw the largest change of land ownership in all of England's history. Part of this is because William introduced something called the feudal system as it was practiced on the rest of the continent. So the rest of Western Europe had already been implementing a version of the feudal system. England had not experienced it yet. And so when the Duke of Normandy came from France, he implemented something called the feudal system. You might have heard of this before, maybe in your history classes. This is Sanoski, I'm pretty sure she teaches you this, but maybe you were um, not paying attention. But we're gonna talk about the feudal system as he installed it in England. I have a little video for you to explain the feudal system and then I'll give you some notes. So we're gonna watch that first and then we'll fill in the next part on your worksheet.
When we Normans took control, we modified the existing hierarchy of land ownership to create the feudal system. The feudal system had four levels. On the top level, the king. The next level, the tenants in chief, which included around 200 Norman barons and bishops. Below this, knights, or under tenants. Way down the bottom were the peasants, sometimes known as serfs or villains. The king directly owned 20% of the land, 25% was owned by the church, and the rest was managed by the levels below. Borrowing land under this agreement was called holding land in tenure. If you held land in tenure, you were known as a vassal, and your feudal superior was a lord. Tenants-in-chief were the closest and most loyal to the king. They promised the king money and an army. They provided soldiers and had a duty to garrison the king's castles for 40 days per year. Knights served in the army and personally protected the tenants-in-chief and the peasants. How brave! In return, they were given land and could be known as Lord of the Manor. They gave a bit of their land to us peasants, but we had to obey the Lord of the Manor in return. We gave him crops and had to work on his land for a bunch of days without pay. This was known as labour service. Some of us were free, but most couldn't leave the Lord's land without permission. That's the feudal system. Okay, so let's fill in some notes about this that gives you kind of a little bit of a background. But basically, feudalism is a very complicated system of land holding. Um, it's a little bit confusing at first. It doesn't seem like it makes sense. Obviously, it's still not in use today, um, but at the time it served the people well, or at least the people at the top of the system, it served them well. Basically, nobody owned the land independently, but only as a servant to some kind of overlord. So the king technically owned everything. He owned all of the land in England, and then he gave some of that land to his lords. And so they lived on these huge estates. So they didn't technically own it, but the king gave it to them and they owed allegiance to the king. Then the lords had to protect their land. So they had knights that lived on their very massive estates. The knights didn't technically own the land that they're living on, but they lived there and they owed allegiance to the lords. And then all the way trickled down to the peasants who worked the fields and had tiny little farms that they um, worked and lived on. And again, they're not owning the land. They owe allegiance to the knights who owe allegiance to the lords who owe allegiance to the kings. And it's kind of a complicated system that nobody really owns anything except the king or some great noble. It's an elaborate chain of royalties, basically, with rent being paid in military service. So, no, it's not like the lords were, you know, giving the king some money each month as their rent was due to their landlord. But how they paid their rent is when the king said, hey, I need some people to attack this other country or protect me or protect this area. The lords would say, let me get my knights on it. And so they would call up, you know, these small armies or, or militaries to help service the king. So that was how they paid their rent. And the knights paid their rent from living on the land to the lords through their military service and so on and so forth. So here's kind of the best way to look at the feudal system. And you'll notice in the next page of your packet, there is a triangle just like this that you can kind of fill in, you don't have to draw the pictures, but with the titles of each part of the feudal system. So all the way at the top, the person that's in charge that owns everything is going to be the king. Okay, he doesn't owe allegiance to anybody else. He rules all of the land and all of the people. 
right beneath him, so this is the name of kind of the second highest ranking, are the lords. So this is the nobility, this is the, the people that were kind of born into these higher classes just from being born because their parents were. They didn't do anything to achieve this position. They are, you know, obviously the highest ranking in all of society besides the king. And so you can see the arrows shows you what each of the groups gets out of this relationship. So the lords owe their loyalty to the king. He's the one that gave them the land. And they also provide him with military aid. They're not the ones doing the fighting. It's the people beneath them. But they, like I said, kind of call up their army to say, oh, go, you know, the king needs your help on this particular thing. And so in return, the king gives them their land that they live on, their huge estates, and he gives them a bunch of peasants to work their fields because obviously they would not go out and work the fields. Beneath them is going to be the knights. So right underneath the lords and right above the peasants. That's where the knights kind of rank in society. And so again, you can see the reciprocal relationship of what they get out of this. So they pay homage to the lords and provide military service. So they owe their allegiance to them and the lords owe their allegiance to the king. In return, they have a place to live. The lords give them some little plot of land, a little house, provide shelter for them on their huge estates. They also get protection. You know, individually, one knight's not going to really do anything, but together they come together as, you know, an army and a group that services the Lord. And then also food. So they are taken care of. So were you living like the best, most luxurious life if you were a knight? No, but you had no worries about where your next meal was coming from. You had, you know, the comforts of basic living provided by the lords in exchange for your military service. And then all the way at the bottom of our triangle, not a, um, a place you wanna be, are the peasants. They are the bottom of the feudal system. So they get from the knights, they live on their land, shelter. So a very, very you know small house that you can just fit your family. It's not gonna be pretty at all. It's not gonna be big. Um, they get protection from the knights. So they're not the ones out there doing the fighting, but the knights protect that land. And then they technically get food in the sense that um, they will have a very small plot of land on by their house that they would work and that they would get their food from. And so in exchange, they pay rent to the knights and they farm the giant fields um, that the lords technically own. So they go out into the fields and they farm them. All of these crops that you know make a lot of money, they give to the knights who gives them to the lords. And that's how the, the wealth kind of trickles back up. And the peasants themselves are on the very bottom of the totem pole and they have very little that they um, actually get for themselves. So it's a little bit complicated of a system, but everybody owes allegiance to somebody else and everybody gets something out of the deal. So for example, you know, I'm the king, I'm the queen, but the king of this classroom. So this whole room is all the country of England. I technically own it. I'm the top of this triangle, um, but I don't have to do anything. I get to sit here on my throne and just kind of watch the money come in and, and get everything I need from it. Right underneath me, I appoint Lydia Valentine to be one of my lords. So I'm gonna give her a plot of land. She's got some peasants to work her fields. She's got some knights to protect her. Um, I give her a title. I give her the land and the peasants, and in return, she owes her allegiance to me, the king, and she also protects me with her knights if I ever needed her to. Some of her knights might include, you know, Dustin Washington. He's out there fighting the bad guys, um, and so he owes his allegiance to Lydia. She'll give him a place to live on her big estate. She will give him peasants to work his fields. And in return, he owes his allegiance to her and will fight for her with the other knights. And then all the way at the bottom of the totem pole is Nico Aramik, who's out there working the fields. He doesn't really get much out of the deal besides a little tiny you know, shack to live in, enough food to keep his family alive. Um, and then he gives all of the crops from the big fields to Dustin and Justin owes his allegiance to Lydia, and Lydia owes her allegiance to me. So I asked um, the other people in class what a feudal system of our school might look like. If we think of that same triangle, what might that look like? Don't worry about this slide. 
All right. Something else that's important to touch on during this period is the medieval church. During this time, during the medieval period, the people in Western Europe, so England, France, a lot of these other countries, they belong to a homogenous, is how you pronounce that word, homogenous society. We know that the root word homo means same. So homogenous is just a same or a similar society. So a lot of the countries such as England, France, Spain, whatever, they had a similar culture, similar beliefs. So yeah, it varied a little bit from country to country, but for the most part, all of Western Europe during this time was a very homogenous society. The medieval church was the institution that did the most to promote this unity. They had the, they were the dominating religion at the time. And so a lot, most people were Catholic. And so that was one thing that brought everybody together. No matter how different your countries were, no matter how much national pride you had, the medieval church was something that promoted this unity in this homogenous society across Western Europe. So one way that it did that was that people could speak the same language. So even though I'm from Spain and I speak Spanish and you're from France and you speak French, the educated people in the church can speak Latin. That was the language of the church at the time. And so we can still communicate with each other, even though we're from different countries and we technically speak different languages if we both speak Latin. Also, no matter how different everybody was or what country they came from, everybody was a son or a daughter of Christ, a son or a daughter of the church. And so that was a, a sense of unity that brought people together and, and supported this homogenous society. Oh, there's the Christ, Lord. It's also important to mention the Crusades that were going on at this time. They were first proclaimed in 1095, was the first of the Crusades, and afterwards other Crusades follow. So this went on for quite a while, um, all of these different Crusades, which the purpose was to rescue the Holy Land, to claim back Jerusalem. The Catholics wanted it for themselves, not any of the other religions that believed the Holy Land belonged to them. So that was the purpose behind that. Um, but in order to do this, they raged war and, you know, killed a lot of people. So not a bright spot in the history of the Catholic Church. But it happened. Can't just skim over that it, that it did not exist. And so it was not a, like I said, a good thing at all. And it was also unsuccessful. It's not like we went in, raged one war, claimed Jerusalem, and it was over. It was kind of unsuccessful in that aspect of reclaiming or saving the Holy Land. But it did bring some things to England, for example, Eastern medicine and knowledge. So as we went to Jerusalem to try to reclaim it and, and save the Holy Land, it brought back knowledge and medicine that we had previously not been exposed to because we didn't really interact much with Eastern Europe. And also encouraged the knightly ideal of behavior known as chivalry. So you might have heard of this word before. Usually people say chivalry is dead. This originated in the medieval period, this idea that as a true gentleman, a true knight of honor, you behaved in a chivalrous manner. And so it was kind of a code of conduct in the way that you were supposed to behave. So we'll actually see some examples of that in the things that we read. Um, we'll see a knight in the way that he kind of holds himself and how he's supposed to be a upstanding member of society. So can I ask the kids in class, can you think of some examples, modern examples of chivalry today? So obviously you're not, you know, going off to fight to war most of the time. But some modern examples of chivalry might be, you know, holding the door open for a lady, um, paying for dinner on your first date are considered examples of chivalry that has adapted or changed a lot over the last thousand years. We're almost done, I promise. Let's talk about the literature of this period. Um, the form of literature favored by the Anglo-Normans, remember that's their relationship name, was the romance. And when you think of romance, you probably think of this, lovey-dovey romance. Um, but that's not what we're going to be talking about 
in this class. When you hear the word romance in the literature, you should think of the word imagination. That's really what romance means. So yeah, sometimes there's a love interest in the story, but romance is really talking about fiction, imagination, coming up with these um, otherworldly or magical concepts. So when we read some things from this period, there are mostly tales of chivalry with maybe a love interest involved, but some sort of imagination, some aspect of wonder, a giant, a fairy, a wizard, a dragon. That's what we mean by romance. That's the imagination element in these stories. Not a lovey-dovey romance like Kim and Kanye. This is what you should be thinking of. Dragons, imagination, some kind of magical or mystical element. All right, the last thing that we're going to talk about is Geoffrey Chaucer and the story that we're going to read first, his story called The Canterbury Tales. So this is the first time in this class and in most of British literature that we actually know some things about an author. We don't know who wrote Beowulf. We don't know who wrote a lot of the Anglo-Saxon poems and riddles. And so Chaucer is one of the first authors that we do actually know a little bit about. We don't know everything, but we have some information on who he was and we actually know his name and can attribute his works to him. So he's one of the first truly great figures in English literature that we know a bit about. He was born in, we think, 1340. It wasn't famous as a baby, so that wasn't documented super well. But we do know when he died for sure, which was in 1400. By that point, he was a famous author um, and had kind of garnered fame and attention from his works. So we do know when he died. He was a great poet. He was a storyteller. And he's the first of the straight-faced humorist is how they used to describe him. You know those people who tell jokes and I like I'm already laughing at my own joke when I'm saying it because I know I'm so funny. There are some people who tell a joke totally stone-faced or straight-faced. Mr. Childs never really know if he's kidding or not because he's got a straight face going on. These masks don't help either. Um, but that would be an example. And that's what Chaucer was like. You almost can't even tell at first that he's joking. And then you realize that he's being funny, that he's being ironic or poking fun or making fun of something. That's what Chaucer was. So he seriously and sometimes ironically makes his points. The work that we're going to read by him is called The Canterbury Tales. It is supposed to be funny. It is supposed to be sarcastic and making fun of people. He made fun of the upper class. He made fun of the Catholic Church. He made fun of the normal everyday people. And he pointed out how um, hypocritical they can be uh, in the things that people notice but never really talked about. The last thing that you need to get is information on the Canterbury Tales. That's what we're going to start reading in this period. Canterbury Tales is the name of this piece. So that's going to be the blank that you'll fill in. The Canterbury Tales are not Chaucer's first piece. He wrote several other things beforehand, but it is probably his most famous and definitely his most ambitious. This was supposed to be a very, very long collection, but he just never finished it. Um, the Canterbury Tales uses a frame story, which is a story within a story. If you've ever seen the movie Inception, a dream within a dream, it's kind of that same concept. Or have you ever been watching a TV show and one of the characters starts watching TV and they take you into the TV show that they're watching? So you're watching TV about a person watching TV. That's kind of what this is. So it's a story. And in the story, people are telling each other stories. So we get to hear the short stories that they tell to one another. The way that he sets this up, the premise of the Canterbury Tales, is that all of these random people are coming together to go on a pilgrimage, which is a religious journey. They're headed to the shrine of St. Thomas a Becket, who was a saint in the Canterbury Cathedral. That's why it's called the Canterbury Tales, because that's where they're headed. So they're going to visit the shrine of the saint, and they're going on this religious journey. And so because of that premise, it's all of these random people that decide to just ride together, you know, for safety and convenience to do that. So people that wouldn't normally interact are able to come together because they're going on this religious journey. So 
So he has people that were in the church, a priest and a nun. He has a knight and a squire, his like assistant. He's got, you know, rich upper class nobility and he's got poor beggars and, you know, kind of evil guys and a woodworker and a farmer and all of these people that wouldn't normally be interacting are able to do so because of the premise of the story. And then he kind of pokes fun at how they would interact with each other. So his plan was for each of the pilgrims to tell two stories on the way to Canterbury and then two stories on the way back from the trip, which would have been 120 four stories. There's that many pilgrims that are on this trip. Um, but Chaucer died after only completing 24 of the short stories. So you can read all of the, the tales, the stories that the pilgrims tell. There's 24 of them. We're going to read one, the Pardoner's Tale. Um, but we're also going to read the introduction to the Canterbury Tales, the prologue that introduces us to all of the characters. That's where we're going to start. The Canterbury Tales is considered the first collection of short stories in English literature. So that is what's part of what it's known for. In addition to being, you know, a comical, a funny piece, um, an important piece of literature, it's considered the first collection of short stories in English literature because each of the pilgrims is telling a short story. Uh, it is written in poetry rather than prose, even though it's a story, it's told as a poem. Um, it has like a natural rhythm to it, some of the lines rhyme. But luckily for you, it is written in Middle English, not Old English. So we're going to see how much the language has changed over time. And it's been translated even to an even more modern version. But it is at least readable, unlike Old English. Okay, I know that was a lot of notes, but thank you for following along and filling in this packet. So you'll notice that there is some of the bullet points on the back that are not filled in. That's at a future date. So you just, I just wanted to put it all together for you so that you would have it in the future. But you can stop there. There's nothing else for you to write in. Um, make sure you either take a picture and upload it to the Google Classroom, or if you typed it, upload it that way. But make sure you have a written copy for your test in the future. And that's pretty much it. Let me know if you have any questions. And thank you. Have a great weekend. Make good choices.